Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Dark Waters, starring Merle Oberon, Preston Foster, and Thomas Mitchell. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. If you were asked to name the wettest state in the Union, and I'm referring now to natural water surfaces and not spirits, you would do well to settle on Louisiana. Over 3,000 square miles of that state are underwater. The southern part, threaded by inland waterways called bayous. All through this bayou country are dark swamps and gaunt palmettos, eerie bogs and moss-draped cypress that have set the stage for so many mysterious legends. Tonight's Lux Radio Theater play, Dark Waters, from a brand new picture just released, takes its mood from those mysterious swamps of Louisiana. It's the story of a strong love haunted by a strange fear. A story as full of excitement and suspense as the swamps themselves are full of beauty and terror. Our stars in this gripping drama are Merle Oberon and Thomas Mitchell in their original screen roles, and Preston Foster. Some time ago, I made a picture laid in the bayou country of Louisiana, and in preparation, I traveled by small boat over hundreds of miles of hidden rivers and shallow lakes. Deep in the bayou country, I met many shrimp fishermen living on their fishing boats. Some of these men had never been able to see a motion picture, but they listened to the Lux Radio Theater regularly every Monday night. In fact, we stopped for provisions at a tiny store that was built on stilts over one of the most out-of-the-way bayous, and on the shelf with fishing tackle, boats of calico, sunbonnets, and notions, I saw those familiar blue boxes of Lux Flakes, which shows that no matter how far from the beaten highways I may travel, I always get a Lux greeting. Now it's curtain time, and here's the first act of Dark Waters, starring Merle Oberon as Leslie... Preston Foster as George, and Thomas Mitchell as Sidney. Did you ever go to a funeral where the minister forgot the service? And they threw the man next to you overboard and all you thought was, he's gone now, there'll be more water to drink. He'll have his share of the water. Somebody said, Oh, God, we can sign the soul to your keeping. And he couldn't think of the rest because he was crazy. And I can't remember either. I can't remember either. Maybe you read about it a few months ago. The steamship Valdera torpedoed in mid-ocean. 500 lives lost. And later, maybe you also read that the four human beings who survived the disaster had been rescued and brought to New Orleans. Among them was a girl named Leslie Calvin. For two months now, she's been in the hospital. I can't remember. I can't remember anymore. My dear, there's no need to remember. You've suffered a horrible shock, but you're well again. It's time you thought about leaving here. I don't know where to go, Doctor. In all this country, there isn't a soul I know. I have an aunt and uncle, my mother's sister. They're in New York. But I've never seen them. Haven't you thought of writing them? I would have written a long time ago, but there's so much to explain, and I just... I just haven't been able to do it. Tell you what. I'll do the explaining. You just write a note, and I'll put mine in with it. Now, what's your aunt's name? Mrs. Norbert Lamont. Address? 731 North Gillespie. Oh, come in, Doctor. I've heard from them, from my aunt. Oh, that's fine, fine. But they're not in New York. They're in Louisiana. Louisiana? Yes, near Belleville. It seems my uncle inherited the plantation some years ago. They moved there in January. They raised sugar cane, and, and they want me. They want me to come right away. You see, of course they do. Doctor, do you think I could leave tomorrow? Yes, you can leave tomorrow. And good luck, my dear. Good luck. <laughs> Excuse 
me, lady. But you've been standing here now. Are you looking for somebody? Yes, I... I... I'm the station agent. Got off the 210, didn't you? They said they'd meet me here. I'll... I'll wait. Oh, do you happen to know them? A Mr. and Mrs. Lamont? Lamont? They have a plantation near here. Rossignol. Why don't you telephone them? I tried. They don't have a phone. Could... Could I get a taxi? Sorry, lady. There isn't... Lady, what's the matter? Don't you feel well? Oh. Eddie, come here. Lady just fainted. Oh, hey, yes. There, there. That's better now. Steady. Breathe deeply. I, I fainted. I don't feel upset about it. The heat's enough to flatten anyone. Oh, uh, I'm Dr. Grover. The station agent sent for me. You rest here a while, and then I'll take you over to my office. No. No, I've... I've got to go back to New Orleans. Aren't the Lamonts expecting you? I don't know. They don't know me. They don't want me. Okay. Here now, drink this. And slowly. People who just come out of hospitals should take everything slowly. How did you know? Well, when you keeled over, a letter fell out of your purse. It was addressed to you at the Cortland Hospital. You know the Lamonts? Only by name. Doctor, I didn't feel faint because of the heat or, or because I've been ill. No? It was fear. Fear of being alone. Of having no one to turn to. Not anyone. But the Lamonts. My aunt and uncle, but, but they're perfect strangers. When they didn't meet me, I, I was terrified. That's oh, nonsense. You like Rossignol. It's a perfect place to convalesce after, well, after whatever it was you were in the hospital for. I, I was on the Valdera. Oh. Only four of us survived. I woke up in the hospital. I've had nightmares constantly of that open lifeboat. I thought it would drive me insane. I was afraid that someday it would be the same whether I were awake or not. Now, look. Why don't we take my car and drive out to Rossignol? And if Lamont's aren't there, I'll get you back here in plenty of time to catch your train. You're very kind. Kind? Around here, Miss Calvin, the only excitement we get is when someone new comes to town. Oh, but I don't want to trouble you. I... Oh, please. This is the kind of trouble I like. Let's go. <laughs> Come in. What a delightful surprise, Miss Calvin. Surprise? But I sent a telegram. Telegram? That's strange. They didn't mention it. Oh, I'm Mr. Sidney. I'm staying here. Your aunt will be delighted. Emily! Emily! She's here. Your niece. Leslie! Oh, my darling. Darling, we've been so worried about you. Oh, Aunt Emily. Oh, now, darling. Oh, but we only knew you were coming. No, but... Come here. Uh, this is Dr. Grover, Emily. He drove Miss Calvin here. Oh, how very kind. Won't you sit down? Well, thanks, but... Emily, did you get a telegram? Why, no. Oh, Norbert. This is Leslie. Uncle Norbert. Oh, Leslie, I'm so happy you're here. And Dr. Grover, dear. How do you do? How do you do? I'll get it. You have a telephone. But you're not listed in the book. Not in the book? That's odd. Odd, Emily. It's listed under Cleve. Oh, of course. You see, Mr. Cleve is our foreman. You should have looked under Cleve, dear. But, Aunt Emily, you didn't say anything about him in your letter. Oh, didn't I? Well, I'm sorry, darling. Dr. Grover, you stay for dinner. I'm sure Florella can produce something. Florella. Oh, dear, the servants you get these days. Thanks, but I have to get back. Office oh, hours. One more time, Doctor. Leslie, come, darling. Upstairs. Goodbye, Miss Calvin. You were wonderfully kind. Thank you again. I'll be out to see you soon. Very soon. Behave yourself. Goodbye. I know you must be tired. I wonder if I could see Mr. Lamont a moment. He seems to have disappeared. Mr. Lamont's writing a book, Doctor. He's hardly aware these days of anything else. Well, then I'd uh, better tell you. I don't want to alarm you, Mr. Sidney, but that girl's been through a terrible experience. I know. The doctor at the hospital wrote us. She seems very nervous. She's been having nightmares. Now she's afraid she's turning into a mental case. A mental case? Well, that's ridiculous, but the point is she must not be allowed to brood about things. Well, we'll do everything, everything we can to help her. Well, just don't question her too much. Help her forget it. I just thought I'd mention it. Oh, that's very kind of you, Doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Sidney. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. Uh... No aisle no, pack for you. Oh, I'm really so upset. My only niece arrived, and this is the reception she gets. But, Aunt Emily, really, I don't mind, and you mustn't. No, but so happy you're here, dear. He mayn't show it, but that's because of his book, Scientific. I help him with the typing. Oh, Leslie, my dear. You don't know what this means to me, Aunt Emily. In the hospital, I thought I was all alone, and now I have a home, my own people who love me. Oh, Leslie, I hope you'll be happy here. Oh, I will. I know I will. Darling, here. I've been saving this for you. This, this miniature. Thank you. It's your mother, Leslie. 
Mother. Painted on her 17th birthday. <laughs> we weren't much alike, were we? She was always the pretty one, and so wonderful to me. Oh, but you're pretty, Aunt Emily. Oh, hush now. The picture's for you, dear. Keep it, darling. Thank you. And this will be your place, my dear. Thank you, Uncle Norbert. Lorella. Yes, sir? Look at the dust in this room and those flowers. You know I've told you about these things a hundred times. I'm sorry, Mr. Sidney. I just didn't get at it today. Well, evening, everybody. Oh, please. Uh, Leslie, uh, this is Mr. Clean. How do you do, Miss Calvin? How do you do? Sit down, please. Well, what's on the menu? Does it ever change? Fried chicken. I hope you'll forgive our funny silver, Leslie. As a matter of fact, all these furnishings, our own things, are still in New York. And you've decided to live here permanently? We talk about it, dear, but there are so many problems. Then why don't you sell, Rossignol? Sell it? I only meant with sugar as scarce as it probably is. No doubt you could get a wonderful price. Emily, I hear someone in the kitchen. Florella. It's just Pearson, ma'am. Pearson. He just came to help with the dishes. Pearson is not allowed up here anymore, Florella. Yes, sir. You must understand that, and so must Pearson. I guess you didn't know what the servant problems were, Leslie, over in the East Indies. East Indies? Miss Calvin's from Batavia, I believe. Well, when did you leave? Over a year ago. A year? But what have you been doing all that time? I mean... In uh, any bombings? Yes. But you got out ahead of the Japs, huh? Yes. Ah, plenty lucky. How'd you do it? On a trading boat. Leslie, darling, you're not eating a thing. Say, I want to hear about this. Where'd you go? We went to Madagascar. Oh? And then what? It was Vichy French. They wouldn't give us our visa. We ran out of money for more. It was such a long time coming. Exasperating delays in wartime. I suppose you took passage from New Orleans from there. Yes. Yes, but the boat sank. Oh, what's the matter with us? Excuse me, honey. Leslie, you want me to come with you, dear? Leslie, wait. You... Hey, some jitter. Yes, very trying on the nerves. Very fried chicken. <laughs> I must say, you look much better this morning, Miss Calvin. You rested well? Oh, yes, thanks. Good. And I know you'll enjoy this walk. You're sure you can spare the time? Oh, I'm delighted to. Sorry about the little unpleasantness last evening. Poor Emily was so upset. If we'd oh, only realized... Oh, please don't apologize, Mr. Sidney. It was very silly of me. Well, look about you, Miss Calvin. Over there is the swampland. Miles of it, unchanged for centuries. Below us, through that growth, is the bio. And beyond is the river. And that old building there? That's the sugar house. And it's on a sort of creek, you see. Oh, there's Cleve. Morning. Morning. In the old days, they made the sugar right here on the place. The water here is very treacherous, Miss Calvin. Apart from reptiles, it's full of sudden depths and shallows. One never knows quite what to expect. Going around, is he, Miss Calvin? Good morning, yes. I was just explaining to Miss Calvin that nature here is not always benevolent. It's fascinating, though. Dark and mysterious. You see in there, Miss Calvin, by that cypress stand? Last year, a woman disappeared in there. Quicksand. We heard her hollering, but when we got there, she was gone. You make it seem really dangerous. It's dangerous only if you're not familiar with it. That's why I'd appreciate it if you don't try to go around by yourself as yet. Cleaver, I will join you. You know, it must be awful drowning in quicksand. Much worse than water. Please, for heaven's sake. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. I wish you wouldn't feel that you have to weigh every word when I'm around. You're a brave girl, Miss Calvin. Mr. Sidney? Uh, yes? Telephone. It's long distance. I'm coming. Excuse me, please. Well, uh, now that we've finally got rid of that walking phonograph, I'll show you around. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd rather not walk anymore. Well, these old tumble-down places bore me, too. And uh, we're both still young enough to have other interests, aren't we? For instance... Well, I mean, we could have some laughs together. How about going into town some night? Dance, maybe? A movie? I think that would be fine, some night. Well, let's ride around the boat. See the rest of the place. Get your bearings. Please. I really don't like boats. Oh, but that's foolish. Best way to see Ross and y'all is by water. Still, I'd, I'd rather not. That's for your own good, Miss Kelvin. You can't go on being a coward. She's not a coward. Oh, Dr. Grover. Morning. You see, she's following my orders. I told her to stay away from boats for a while. Your orders? Mr. Cleve, this is Dr. Grover. <laughs> Glad to know you. I didn't mean to say the wrong thing. Well, forget it. Perhaps later on. I didn't expect you this soon, Doctor. Well, I have a patient nearby. I thought you might like to take a ride. Oh, I'd love to. 
Okay with you, Cleve? Sure. You go right ahead, Miss Calvin. Goodbye. Then she got in Grover's car and they drove off. The back road? Yeah, he must know this neck of the woods pretty good. Why are you two so concerned about the doctor? What difference does it make? Well, it's becoming rather obvious that Leslie and the doctor enjoy each other's company tremendously. What of it? What harm is that? Please, Emily, please, aren't you getting all worked up over nothing at all? I just don't understand you at times. And that long-distance call from New Orleans. Yeah, what about that? Don't be inquisitive, Cleve. There was no call. For some reason, he just wanted to leave Leslie alone with you. Oh. We have loads of time, all the time in the world. What are you talking about? Nothing. Suppose we all just relax, huh? Emily, my dear, what do we have for lunch? Before our stars return with Act Two of Dark Waters, here's a girl with a question on her mind. Why did I get that run? Why did I get that run? Isn't that the darndest luck? I can't think what I've done. Well, if you want to cut down those costly runs, stop blaming luck and change to Lux. Luxing stockings cut down runs helps you to get double wear. You see, stockings must be able to stretch under strain then spring back into place without breaking. That's elasticity. Lux saves this vital elasticity. Wrong washing methods weaken it. If you use a strong soap or rub stockings with cake soap, the threads snap easily into runs. Now, millions of girls know how Lux cuts down runs, but this has also been proved by a famous laboratory. They made strain tests on dozens of stockings, and those washed with Lux flakes didn't go into runs nearly so quickly as the ones washed with a strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. In fact, they lasted twice as long. So be sure to lux your stockings every night. And a hint about rayons. Let them dry thoroughly before wearing them, at least 24 hours. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act Two of Dark Waters, starring Merle Oberon as Leslie, Thomas Mitchell as Sidney, and Preston Foster as George. Eight days have passed since Leslie Calvin's arrival at the ancient plantation. But eight days have added little to her knowledge of the people there, or of the bewildering countryside, where scenery changes with a turn of the head from breathtaking beauty to black and reeking swamplands. Leslie, however, hasn't given much thought to all of this. Dr. Grover has been her daily visitor, and today he's taken her to a tiny Cajun fishing village, deep in the bayous. Hello, Mama. Oh, Miss Calvin, Madame Boudreau. How do you do? Such a pleasure, Mademoiselle. And over there, Leslie. Now, let me see. There's Cecile, Yvette, Pierre, and Talmat. You kids, allons. Dis quelque chose, oh, Doctor. Well, 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 well. Now, which one's my patient? Patient, Doctor? Napoleon de Gare told me a Boudreau had fallen out of a tree. Oh, I did. All the way from the top, Doctor. Oh, a very small tree. He wasn't hurt. A very high tree, Mama. I knocked out myself, too. And when did that happen? Oh, last week, I think, Mademoiselle. Well, still, I'd better prescribe something. Candy. Wait, Doctor. I climbed the tree again. <laughs> hey, 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 an epidemic. Well, I'll pass it around. Oh, look, Doctor. See? For the fed dodo. Oh, look, Leslie. That platform over there. That means dancing here tomorrow night. Dancing? But what's a fey dodo? Fey dodo means go to sleep. You're not making much sense, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect sense. The grown-ups yell fey dodo to the kids. The kids go to sleep and the grown-ups dance. Oh, oui, mademoiselle. Fine music, too. Violin, a big fiddle, accordion. Oh, but you have never seen fey dodo. No, I'm afraid I haven't. Doctor. Oh, by all means. Leslie, tomorrow night you'll see a fey dodo. Okay? Wonderful. And so much to eat, eat, and dance, and drink wine, and eat. You see, uh, good cooking is terribly important around here. The boys propose to the pretty girls, but they marry the good cooks. Oh, fine. I'll die an old maid. I can boil eggs, and, uh, well, I can boil eggs. <laughs> That's perfect. I'm crazy about boiled eggs. Come inside, then, and boil eggs. Time for lunch. Oh, Mama, not uh, shrimps a la boudreau. Sure, I fix shrimp a la myself. <laughs> 
Come, come now. Hey, kids, eat it. Eat it. <laughs> home again. The whole day's gone. I can't believe it. Well, evening, Leslie. Hello, doctor. Hello. Have a good day. Oh, yes. I hope you haven't been waiting for me. Oh, no, 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 but we're dining early. We're all going to the movies. Well, I'd better say goodbye. Have a good time, and don't forget tomorrow night. I won't. Goodbye, George, and thank you. Bye. Goodbye, Mr. Sidney. Uh, goodbye, doctor. Tomorrow night? Oh, yes. The pay dodo. Oh, splendid. Say, he's a very fine chap, that doctor. Very nice. Well, let's hurry, my dear. Your aunt can't wait to see that picture. Good dog. One child. Well, here we are, Leslie. Belleville's only theater. Uh, get the tickets, Cleve. Sure. Mr. Sidney, did Aunt Emily say why she couldn't come? Didn't she tell you? No. Oh, that's right. You were waiting out in the car. Poor woman. She was so set on coming. But it was Norbert. Oh? Yes. He suddenly made up his mind to work tonight. He's helpless without Emily. Really, he should be more considerate. Well, let's go. Tickets, please. First time to the right, please. The seat's okay, Miss Calvin. Fine. Hey, just in time for the newsreel. To me, the newsreel's always the best part of the show. In the background, a British butcherman bursts a flame. Lifeboats are being lowered into the oil drenched sea. The women and children on deck indicate the ship is carrying refugees. The submarine now reaches the position for the kill. And the second and third torpedoes are fired. Oh, no. Death sweeps through the sea. And with a blinding flash, the ship is The waters blazing with oil are filled with the helpless victims. Candy? The no, submarine you. surfaces. But the murderers are not content. A machine gun is trained on the lifeboat. Excuse the me. The German officer near the conning tower. I can't look at any more. I, I can't. Where are you going? Uh, Leslie. 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 Wait a moment. I'll come with you. Leslie. Anything you want, Leslie? Nothing. Good night. It was inexcusable, my dear. I should have found out what was showing first. Please try to forgive me. I'll be all right in the morning. Well, rest well, dear. Good night. Good night. Are you ill? Noises. And the lamp here by my bed. It went out. The lamp? But it's on. See, dear. I heard a noise and, and the lamp went out and came on again by itself. Oh, but it couldn't have. I mean, oh, that noise. Oh, it's just the screen. See? It's on fast. You must be frightened, dear. Shall I turn the light out for you? No. Oh, thank you, Aunt Emily. I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. I'm sure it was that awful news reel. It must have upset you terribly. Good night, dear. I'll leave your door open. What was it, Emily? Get up the light, Mr. That's strange. That poor child. That poor child. trying to get you alone all day. Why? What for? Well, Mr. Cleve won't let me around here no more. I got to talk fast, miss. Why won't he let you here? I don't know. I worked here 12 years, miss. 12 years. And just after your aunt and uncle come down from up north, well, Mr. Cleve give me my pay and say never come back. I don't know why. 
I'll try to find out, Pearson. I lost my aunt. Thank you, miss. I ain't done nothing wrong, miss. Nothing in this world wrong. I'm sure of that, Pearson. Uh, yes, sir. Well, the day Mr. Cleve tells me to get one, well, I ask could I see Mr. Lamont, and he says no, he's feeling poorly. And every time I come back, he drives me off. I remember... Oh, somebody coming, miss. I've I got to get away. Uh, Leslie? Yes? Uh, oh, there you are. Emily said you had a headache. I was just resting here in the garden. I think I'll go to my room, though. It's, it's still so warm. I can't forgive myself for last night. Thank goodness you're no worse. Your uncle mentioned getting a psychiatrist, but I told him... Uh, psychiatrist? Well, your disturbance in the night, my dear. Anyway, there's certainly no need for a psychiatrist. I told him that. You just get all the sleep you can and have patience. Psychiatrist. <laughs> Florella. She said she just couldn't eat, ma'am. There was nothing she wanted. No, ma'am. I guess she just don't feel well. Dr. Grover has come. Of course, she won't want to go to the dance, but maybe she'd like to see him. Yes, ma'am. I'll go out. Yes, uh, Leslie's been under the weather all day. I'm just wondering, doctor, is she up to a night out? Oh? What's the matter? To tell the truth, we're not quite sure. Why didn't you call me? Because you have ill people to take care of, and I'm not ill. Leslie, my dear. Darling, you're feeling better. Hello, Leslie. What's all this I hear? Oh, just nonsense. Leslie, you're not going out. Well, maybe it'll do her good, Mr. Sidney. Oh, I think it's really out of the question. Well, let's hear what Leslie has to say. Would you like to go? Yes, I think I would. This is most ill at I'll prescribe for Leslie, Mr. Sidney. I'll go up now and change. I'll be down in a minute. I'm sorry if I seemed abrupt, but as I told you, what she needs is cheering up. I can't remember when I've had so much fun. Do they do this often, George? Oh, every couple of weeks or so. Well, here's to the next one. To the next one. And all the others after that. You take to these dances like a native. A marble drove says you must have been born dancing. <laughs> my mother used to say that my feet would have to do all the dancing for the two of us. The two of you? Yes, she was an invalid. She never walked from the time she was a child. My father always carried her. Oh. George, would you mind if we left now? If you wish. I'll say goodbye to the good rose and I'll take you home. Thank you again, George, and good night. Leslie, wait. Yes? Leslie, being a country doctor's wife isn't much of a future for a girl, but if you tried to overlook the bad parts, well... George. I'd, I'd try as hard as I know how to make it worth the trouble. Oh, no, George, no. I love you, darling. Don't say that, please. Leslie, what I'm trying to do is ask you to marry me. And you mustn't. Well, what's wrong, Leslie? I can't tell you. I can't ever tell you. And I mustn't see you like this. I must never see you again, George. Goodbye. Leslie. <laughs> Leslie. Is that you, Leslie? Yes, Aunt Emily. Did you have a good time? I had a wonderful time. Why, you're... you're crying. He asked me to marry him. Dr. Grover? Yes. And you don't want to? Oh, but I do, I do. Why, then I... I just don't understand I can't marry George or anyone else, Aunt Emily. But why, dear? If you knew you were going out of your mind, would you think... I won't have you saying such things. You're much better. No, I'm not. I'm not. All the time I see and hear things that aren't there. People in their right minds don't have hallucinations. Oh, you poor child. Did you tell Dr. Grover about it? No, and I'm never going to see him again. Oh, why did they pull me out of the water? That's where I belong, under the water with my mother and father. <laughs> Aunt Emily, yes? did you call? Did you call me? Why, no, dear. It's funny. I thought I heard you. I'm sorry. Go back to bed, dear. Good night. Good night. Leslie! Leslie, tell me! No. Leslie. No! Leslie! Leslie, tell me! Who? Leslie! Who 
Who is it? Miss Calvin. Jackson. Miss Calvin, did you hear your name being called? What? What did you say? Uh, yes, ma'am. What do you mean, yes, ma'am? Did you hear my name? Uh, yes, ma'am, I sure did. You heard them. You heard them. Then they're really there. Uh, yes, miss. But you shouldn't be wandering around in the dark like this. Oh. But what are you doing here? Because i got to find out. And when I do, I'll let you know. But there's one thing I do know, Miss Leslie. Whosoever's out there in the swamp, it's you they want. Because they're calling your name. So get in the house, ma'am, please, right this minute. All right, Pearson, I'll go, but... There's a path there. I'll watch from here until you stay back in the house. George Grover, please. Yes? Oh, when will he be back? Well, would you please give him a message? Would you ask him to call Leslie Calvin? Yes, it's very important. Thank you. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Mr. DeMille and our stars will return with Act Three of Dark Waters in a moment. But here comes Sally. What's that she's got? Oh, a calendar. 27, 4, 11, 18. What are you doing, Sally? Calling football signals? At <laughs> this late date, don't be silly. Nope, I'm checking up. Do you realize it's just four weeks before Christmas? What about it? Uncle Sam is asking us to do our shopping early this year, in November if possible, and that's just three days more. Well, I'd better get busy. There's my sister, for instance. I've been wondering about a present for her. Well, I'm giving mine a slip. And these are pretty and practical, too. I should have known you'd choose something luxable. <laughs> but of course. Besides, girls can always use another slip or nighty. Why, from Oregon to Massachusetts, the girls will welcome one or two sets. Oh, Sally. <laughs> Don't go away. I've got another one. From Texas up to North Dakota, put under things on your gift quota. That's enough. I'll take your word for it. And I'm going to tuck a box of Lux Flakes in with my sister's gift. A hint to the wise? Yes, or I may write a little verse to remind her. Something like, um, don't risk these undies in soaps that are strong. Lux keeps them new looking three times as long. More truth than poetry, Sally. It's true that strong soap and hot water ruin pretty slips in actual washing tests. Yet the very same kind of slips stayed lovely with Lux Care. New looking three times longer washed the Lux way. So it pays to stick to gentle Lux flakes. Now, back to Mr. DeMille and our stars. I'm sure all of you would like to meet our stars in person. So after the play tonight, I'll do the next best thing and bring them to the microphone for a personal, informal chat. Now here's Act Three of Dark Waters, starring Merle Oberon as Leslie, Preston Foster as George, and Thomas Mitchell as Sidney. The long hours of the night are sleepless hours for Leslie Calvin as she waits for George Grover to return her telephone call. Her mind frantically seeks an answer to the events that have occurred since her arrival at Rossignol. But there is no answer. And now, in the gray hours of early morning, she rouses her Aunt Emily and leads her to her room. Somehow I feel there's no time to lose, and I must know. Oh, I wish Dr. Grover would call. I'm sure he could prescribe something for your nerves. There's nothing I need, Aunt Emily. Right now, for the first time in months, I feel well again. I know now that there's nothing wrong with me. Aunt Emily, what do you know about Mr. Sidney? How long have you known him? Mr. Sidney? Why, he and Norbert have been friends since school days. He handles all your uncle's affairs. Why, he's a lifesaver to us. And you trust him? Leslie, what a question. What about Mr. Cleve? Cleve's run the plantation for years. He's done just wonders with it. But it's got to be them, or one of them. Aunt Emily, I told you I thought I was losing my mind. Little things have been happening. Things that I thought I imagined. And then tonight I heard voices. But I did hear voices. 
They were real voices. Leslie, dear. I know they were real because Pearson heard them too. Somebody's been trying to make me think I was going crazy. It's a terrible thing to say, Leslie. I'll tell Norbert at once. He'll get to the bottom of this. Oh, if you only knew how relieved I am. It's like... It's like being born again. And to think only a few hours ago I told George I never wanted to see him. I thought I never dared fall in love, ever. Aunt Emily, do you think he'll ask me to marry him again? Of course he will. Such a nice young man, Leslie. And we could have the wedding right here at Rothing Knoll. And if you want, I'll write New York. They can send me the trunk with the dress your mother wore at her wedding. Aunt Emily, you and Mother were very close, weren't you? Inseparable, dear. She used to tell me about all the beaux you had and the parties you went to. She was really the popular one, dear. She never missed a dance. Her dance program was always still first. Was, was Mother a good dancer? Wonderful. Waltzes, two-steps, polkas. I see. I see. I mustn't keep you up any longer. Go back to bed, dear. We can talk at breakfast. Oh, yes, we must. And I'm so happy you're feeling better. So happy. Miss Leslie. Sorella, what are you doing out here? I was praying you'd come outside. I was praying you would. I got up so early, I thought I'd take a little walk before breakfast. You're looking for Pearson, aren't you, Miss? Aren't you? Where is he? Pearson's dead. That's why I had to see you. Pearson is dead. Last night, miss, he was murdered. Murdered. Before he died, he made me promise to tell you. Tell me? Tell me what? He says, tell Miss Leslie. He found out. They're not your real aunt and uncle. He said to leave this place, miss. And there's one more thing I can tell you. That telegram you sent before you came here. Yes? It did come, miss. I seen Mr. Sidney take it. I'm going now, miss. You go, too. Please go. Please, before it's too late. Morning, Miss Calvin. Good morning. Sit down, dear. I'll have your breakfast in a minute. No, thank you, Aunt Emily. I can get it. Lorella didn't come this morning. She simply didn't come. That's obvious. Emily, just look at these chicken livers. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. I wonder what's happened to Florella. I'll get it. Oh, no. It may be for me. Oh. I'll be right back. Norbert. Leslie woke me very early this morning. Oh, the strangest thing. Hello? Leslie? Oh, George. I've been trying to get you. When are you coming out? Coming out? Didn't you say something about never wanting to see me again? Uh, a girl can change her mind, can't she? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm kind of tied up today, Leslie. How about tonight? Good. Then I'll expect you right away. Leslie, what is this? You'll be here in an hour? I don't get it. Leslie, you're not making sense, you know. But maybe you, you, you can't talk. Is that it? Look, I'll be out as soon as I can, dear. Thank you, George. Thank you. Goodbye. Your coffee's on the table, dear. Coming. I take it that was the doctor, Leslie. Yes. He'll be stopping by in a little while. Fine. And we must see to it that you and your doctor have the veranda all to yourselves without any inconvenient dodderers about. <laughs> Thank you. Why, well, Leslie, I believe you're blushing, dear. By Jove, she is. Well, well, well. George, George, thank God you're here. Leslie, what's the matter? I don't know how much time I'll have. I'll tell you as quickly as I can. Well, let's go up on the porch. I thought I was going mad. Really mad. It wasn't like that. I mean, I did hear voices, but they weren't just in my mind. Pearson heard them, too. He's dead. They killed him. Now, wait a minute. They killed him because he saw my real aunt and uncle before they came. They aren't. They're imposters. They wanted me to think I was losing my mind. Noises, lights, on and off and on and off, and my name. They called my name. Oh, George, George, that's why I said I couldn't marry you. That's why I... Now, Leslie, Leslie, try to be calm, please. George, take me away quickly. Please, please, take of me course, away. Of course, darling, but... Now, you must listen to me. What you need is a few more hours sleep. George, you don't know what you're saying. They'll kill me like they did Pearson. Why would they? You don't believe me. George, you don't believe me. Look, darling, your trouble is simply a bad case of jitters. Now, now listen, I'll be back here tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow will be too late. 
Meanwhile, I want you to take these capsules. I'll write the directions down. You follow the directions and please go to bed. Now, will you do that much for me? Yes, thank you. Now, take one of the capsules right away. But before you do, read what's on the paper. I'll phone later and see how you are. I'm sorry to have bothered you, George. Goodbye. That you, Mr. Sidney? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, Doctor. Something I can do? I'm worried about Leslie. She's just been telling me some pretty fantastic things. Her aunt and uncle are imposters. Somebody's going to kill her. Is this a joke, Doctor? Please. Leslie's very ill. That's awful. What can we do? Well, I want to get hold of a psychiatrist. I'll make all arrangements and bring him out here as soon as I can. All we can do, I suppose, is wait. Yes. I've given her a sedative. Just see that she isn't disturbed. No, well, we'll do everything we can. Oh, uh, Doctor, would you mind dropping me by the sugar house on your way out? Glad to. Hop in. Where are you, dear? I'm in my room. George gave me some medicine. I've got to lie down. The directions. Read the directions. I'll be up in a moment, dear. Take the capsules right away. But before you do, read what's on the paper. What's on the paper? Stay in your room. Sydney is listening to everything we are saying. I believe you. We'll come back with help right away. Throw the capsules away and remember I love you. Oh, George! George! Come in, both of you. And close the door. Now, where's the girl? In her room. Wait a minute, Sydney. We heard you talking to the doctor, so he's going for a psychiatrist. You know what that means? Certainly I know. He said psychiatrist. That will never do. He may mean police, and that will do still less. We're getting out of here, Sidney. We don't want any part of this. You hired us to be her aunt and uncle, but we didn't bargain for anything like murder, and you know it. Nothing's going to happen to that girl. Do you hear? Nothing. I'm afraid all sentimental considerations must be put aside. I've got a pretty good idea what you're up to, Sidney, and we are leaving. You can keep the money, all of it. Now, let's try to talk sense for a moment. My instinct is to clear out, too. This is all starting to become rather messy, and I don't like messes. All right. Suppose we did clear out. How far do you think we'd get to the state line? You can stop using we. This is your problem, Sidney, not ours. You are in it just as deeply as I am. Surely you've guessed by now what became of the real Lamonts. The less said the better, but still a fact is a fact. They're dead. You killed them. Cleve killed them. We never saw the Lamonts. What you and Cleve did went on before we ever got here. And if you were sitting on a jury, would you believe that? You should thank your lucky stars, both of you, that someone around here can use his head. Now go upstairs and bring down that girl. Cleve and Dr. Grover are waiting for her at the sugar house. Hey, you awake, Doc? <sighs> yeah. Want a drink? Coke and rum. Thanks. If I was you, I'd get cockeyed, too. Here. Here. Just don't get any more ideas of playing rough. You'll get slugged again, as per Mr. Sidney's instructions. You do everything you're told, don't you, Cleve? I got a mind of my own. What's happened to Leslie? Forget it, sport. I can guess. The same thing that happened to her real aunt and uncle. Sidney figured you was wise. They're out in the bayou, under the water hyacinth. That's where they are, all right. But not the girl. Not yet. Sidney phoned down a few minutes ago. They'll be here any minute. Nice and dark now. Cleve, why are you afraid of Sidney? Me? Afraid? Well, you do all the dirty work, don't you? You don't see him pulling the trigger or using the knife? Oh, no. Not with you around to do it for him. Get wise, will you? Open up, please. Okay. You see, sport, I told you they were coming. Ah, hello, Miss Calvin. Leslie. George. George, darling. Try not to worry, dear. We're not dead yet. Dr. Bolt, Cleve, uh, if you please, doctor. This way. Uh, Cleve, wait, come here. Yeah? Cleve, huh, you... just a minute. You've been drinking. You've got no right to do that, Mr. Sidney. No impudence now, young man. Now, look. I don't like being ordered around like dirt under somebody's feet, see? Ask me please to do something, and maybe I will, and maybe I won't. But I don't take orders, see? <laughs> Cleve's two different boys, Miss Calvin. Cleve drunk and Cleve sober. <laughs> Well, Miss Kelvin, now you understand how you heard voices calling you. A recording? Exactly. Operated by an electric clock. 
And the lamp? That was no accident either. Simple devices, really, but they both failed their purpose. Too bad, but they did. You see, we intended only to make you leave here. We had no violence in mind. Yes, we did everything we could for Leslie, Doctor. And tell me, Sidney, what's so important that it's worth killing the Lamonts and Pearson and now us? Why, money, of course. What else? Uh, 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 Cleve, get that motor started. I got two hands and that's all. How much money? Well, bearing in mind we have no time to dig her, about $300,000. The plantation could bring much more, but after all, we're not greedy. I can see what a nuisance I must have been arriving when I did. By the way, people are bound to ask questions about George. We'll tell them you eloped. They'll be leaving long enough for us to consummate the sale and be off. What do you mean, us? You're not trying to tell me that you intend to cut an auntie and uncle and cleave... I beg your pardon? Five murders, Mr. Sidney. Why not eight? Take Cleve now. What's going to keep you from disposing of Cleve after Cleve's disposed of us? That would be only business according to your standards. And then after Cleve come the aunt and uncle. The boss, ready. Good lad. Untie him. Don't turn your back on him, Cleve. And keep that gun of yours off safety. Shut up, you. Oh, well, darling, here we go. I try to be brave, George. I try to be brave. Circle around, Cleve. The hyacinths are getting thicker now. I tell you, this is the place. They're so thick here, nothing would ever float to the surface. It's too dark to tell anything. I want to make sure. And I was going to be brave. I can't help it, George. I can't help it. Easy, darling, easy. Just be ready to jump. Yes. This box is good as any cave. Okay. And now I got something to tell you. I'm not taking any chances, Sidney. You might pull a fast one at that. Take your gun out of your pocket and drop it overboard. My dear boy, you're not going to take what this fellow said seriously. There's going to be only one gun in this boat, Sidney. And that's mine. That's telling him, Cleve. Shut up! You heard me, Sidney. Dr. Grover, you poisoned this boy's mind. I'm tempted to do the job on you myself. Drop your gun over the side. As you wish. Jump, Leslie. Jump. Gun your motor, Cleve. We'll run them down. Can you see them? They're heading for the highest end. On your left, hurry. George, are you all right? My arm. The propeller. You turn on the headlight. George, they're coming this way. The shore is ahead of us. We'll skirt the hyacinths. We'll swim. Underwater. Can you, can you make it? I'll, I'll try, darling. I'll try. There they are. Shoot. Fool, shoot. That's something. George, they're out of the boat. They're coming. They're coming. Wait for you. Get out of there. Get out of there. Keep down, darling. They've got a flashlight. But we, we can't stay here. But there's quicksand around here. We've got to stay here. They may not spot us. It's black as pitch. You're on, George. It's all right. Quiet, dear. Please. Where are you? Right ahead of you. The wind of them. They're here somewhere. I saw them. Of course they're here. Take the flashlight and give me your gun. What? I said give me your gun. I'm wasted four shots already. Here. That's better. Now go straight ahead. I'll circle around. We're wasting time. Where are they going to go? Please, you tell me that. Where are they going to go? Come out of there. Come on out. I'll find you. Please. He's coming towards us. Hold tight, darling. And quiet. Quiet. What chance have you got? Or would you sooner stay here with the moccasins and starve to death? Cleve. Where are you? Where are you? Straight ahead, Cleve. Well, it's about time. I... Sidney! Sidney! Quicksand! I'm sinking! Sidney, hurry! Where are you? This way! Quicksand! Sidney, help! Help! Don't struggle, Cleve. He's going oh. under, George. He's going under. You can't get out by yourself, Cleve. Sidney! Sidney, I... I can't, Cleve! You oh. can't see him, Sidney. Sidney! His flashlight's gone, but he's right ahead of you. 
Sidney. Throw the gun over here, and I'll get him out for you. Sidney, throw the gun! You've got only three bullets left now, Sidney. Only three. Don't shoot. Throw him the gun! I'm sinking! Help! You better hurry, Sidney. He's... Help! Well, Sidney, he's gone now. You've lost your guide. You'll never get out of here now unless I lead you. Go on. Try and get out if you don't believe me. Cleve knew the swamps, and look what happened to Cleve. No, not that way, Sidney. It looks solid enough, but it's quicksand. What are you waiting for? You've got your choice of two things. You can... Oh. Your choice of two things. George. Stay down, darling. Down. There's only one bullet left now. Well, come and get us, Sidney. Or just turn around and get back to the boat if you can. But I won't pull you out, Sidney. I'll let you sink as you let Cleve sink. One bullet. And after that's gone, you'll stay here forever, too. George, he's coming. He's coming. Go on, Sidney, shoot. And then figure out how you'll save yourself. You can throw me that gun and let me show you the way out. There's the gun. I thought you'd understand. Lost in the swamp at night. It's hard on the nerves. All right, Sidney. Turn around and start walking. Leslie? Yes? I'm afraid I'll have to lean on you, dear. Oh, George, darling. Hurry, darling. The boat's not far off. We'll make it all right. We'll make it. You can take the wheel, darling? Yes, I'll try, George. Good girl. You can be a remarkably silent man, Mr. Sidney. When there's nothing to say, Doctor, I make it a point to say nothing. I'm contemplating my future. If I were you, I'd leave that to the state of Louisiana. Uh-huh. Perhaps you're right. Straight ahead, Leslie. You're doing fine. Straight ahead, darling. Straight ahead. And I'm not afraid, George. I'm all right. I'm all right. Our stars will be back for a curtain call in just a moment. Meanwhile, listen. Which one of these scenes might happen in your kitchen? This one? I'm Nancy. And I'm the strong soap she uses in her dishpan. I hate washing dishes. It leaves my hands so red and rough. <laughs> That's my work. Every time Nancy puts her hands in the dishpan, I go for them. I sting them and roughen them and make them red. You should have seen her husband's face last night when he introduced her to his captain. <laughs> or in your kitchen, is it this scene? I'm Jane, and I'm Gentle Lux Flake. The soap she uses for dishes. My hands don't get that dishpan look. Why, they're just as nice after washing dishes as before. That's because I take such good care of Jane's hands. I don't make them red and rough. I keep them soft and smooth and lovely. Jim was so proud of her when she pinned on his wings. Prettiest hands I've ever seen, he said. If your hands are dishpan red like Nancy's, you can change them. Yes, change them to lovely Lux hands like Jane's. Just change from strong soaps to Lux flakes for dishes. And I'll tell you another secret. Lux is thrifty. It does more dishes than ordinary soap. Tests proved it. Ounce for ounce, Lux does up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other leading soaps. Get a big box for dishes today. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. And now our stars, having settled their problems, for better or worse, return to happier surroundings for their curtain calls. And I expect all three of you... Uh, glad to be back on solid ground. Well, I'm sort of sorry to leave Louisiana CB. There's uh, wonderful duck hunting in those marshes. <laughs> and if you mention the name Foster to a duck, he ducks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, so I hear. A few weeks ago, we had we had Frank Morgan on this stage, Preston. He gave us a sample of hog calling. 
I hear you're uh, pretty good at uh, duck calling. No fooling. Uh, how do you do it, Press? Sure. Well, uh, uh, first you uh, first you have to put out your decoy. Decoy? Yeah, that's a stand-in for a duck. Oh. You know what a duck is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a uh, chicken on snowshoes. Well, you uh, <laughs> you put out your decoys and then you give them the old come on like this. Quack 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 quack. That's <laughs> very good, Preston, but how, how, how about geese? Well, geese are a little bit different. Now, for geese, it's something like this. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, Preston, I wouldn't talk like that even to a goose. <laughs> uh, Tommy, how, how are you with a shotgun, Tommy? Well, I once got a duck at 75 yards. He dropped from over 100 feet. Why did you waste your shells? The fall alone would have killed him. <laughs> Merle, Merle, I, I, I'm not sure you've had the right experience to go duck hunting. Of course I have. I shot a duck once, hit him in the head and foot. Foot and head? Both? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Don't ask me. He must have been scratching his head. Oh, no. <laughs> Merle, I think you're safer at home listening to the Lux Radio Theater. What will you have for us on Lux next week, C.B.? Well, I, I spent one of the most absorbing evenings the other night watching Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's motion picture hit, The Unguarded Hour. The next morning, I hasten to secure it for the Lux Radio Theater, and that's our play for next Monday night. It's a story full of suspense, involving a woman who, in trying to save her husband from disgrace, becomes trapped in a mystery that even Scotland Yard can't solve. And for our stars, we have a very special treat in the handsome shape of Robert Montgomery. His first appearance on the Lux Radio Theater after four years in the Navy. <laughs> and with Bob, we have the ever-lovely Lorraine Day. Sounds like a great homecoming for Bob, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You sail through dark water beautifully. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Montgomery and Lorraine Day in The Unguarded Hour. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. American housewives have a vitally important job, saving kitchen fats and greases that are desperately needed in our final drive for victory. Don't waste a drop of this essential war material. Put your waste fats in a clean can and rush them to your butcher. He'll give you two red ration points and four cents for each pound. The motion picture Dark Waters, starring Merle Oberon, Francho Tone, and Thomas Mitchell, was produced by Benedict Bogus and released through United Artists. Preston Foster will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox Technicolor production, Thunderhead, Son of Flicka. Thomas Mitchell can currently be seen in Daryl F. Zanuck's Technicolor picture, Wilson. Heard in tonight's play were Charles Seal, Leo Cleary, Janet Scott, Norman Field, Ruby Dandridge, Tyler McVeigh, Gloria Charmley, Yana Delos, Mickey Kuhn, and Horace Willard. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear The Unguarded Hour with Robert Montgomery and Lorraine Day. Fry, S-P-R-Y. Better, better cook with fry, because you'll be a better, better cook with fry. Cakes, pies, fried foods, everything tastes better made with new Easy Mix Fry Shortening. So for light, fluffy cakes, tender, flaky pastry, crisp, digestible fried foods... Better, 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 better cook with fry. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Unguarded Hour with Robert Montgomery and Lorraine Day. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>